In her article titled, What is Deep History?, written for the Term 1 edition of our journal Teaching History in 2022, Anne McGrath wrote the following. Deep history aims to address the long time span of human history that extends beyond the modern, the pre-modern, the medieval, and the ancient, or at least what is usually defined as such. This makes deep history especially important for any study of Australian history, a story that cannot be fully told without expanding our thinking about history's periodization. This new historical turn reflects an effort to shift the discipline's framing. And she went on to write, One of the key questions that deep history addresses is the question of why Indigenous people have so long been perceived as history's outsiders, as not being players in global history, and as somehow not having a history of their own. End quote. Interestingly, and perhaps reflecting some of this enthusiasm among historians for deep time, the most recent update to the 7 to 10 history component of the Australian National Curriculum published in mid-2022 included an entire mandatory topic called Australia's Deep Time History. It's by far the newest addition to the history content in this version, 9.0, of the Australian Curriculum. In the interview for this episode, I talked to Dr. Louise Zamati from the University of Tasmania about the article that she wrote for the same edition of Teaching History I quoted from just earlier. This piece provides a brilliant introduction to thinking about how we might prepare as teachers to explore deep time content with students in their early secondary years. We obviously weren't able to cover every theme or issue raised in the article, So I'd encourage you to find a copy of it uh, if you're preparing to teach this content for the first time. Before I start this interview, I just want to make one quick clarification, and that is that it's not yet known how closely some Australian states, such as New South Wales and Victoria, will follow the national curriculum in mandating deep time content for Year 7. So while we talk a lot in this interview about preparing to teach this kind of content, we're well aware that this is likely to be an uneven requirement across all of the jurisdictions. For those adopting the national curriculum wholesale, however, this is a new requirement that's coming in in the near future, and it's probably this audience that we had primarily in mind as we conducted this interview. As always, thanks for listening, and please visit www.htansw.asn.au for news of our upcoming events. And here is the interview with Dr. Louise Zamati. Hi, Louise. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Jonathan. Thank you for having me. Uh, I just wanted to quickly start, if it's okay, to to get you to talk a little bit about your background in education and archaeology so that people have got some sense of where um, you're coming at, the the things that we're about to discuss from. Well, I've had a bit of a um, a mixed uh, professional life, really. I've been a high school teacher, and I did that in New South Wales for many years. So I I worked as a senior history teacher in um, private schools and and state schools. And and I was a member of the HTA executive for quite a while. Uh, And I've also been an archaeologist. So um, yeah, I've had two loves in my life. So I've tried to combine both of them. Uh, I trained as an archaeologist in uh, Cambridge. And um, I've worked at many on many archaeological excavations around the world and also in Australia. So there's a there's a very healthy sort of um, dual identity here, bring brought to brought to bear on the issues that we're going to discuss in terms of deep a little bit, history. A little bit schizophrenic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, all right. Well, I guess you know one of the main reasons we're we're here to talk this morning is the the changes that have been made to version nine of the Australian curriculum, and particularly this new content that's been put into the year seven um, uh, content for history, which is focusing on uh, deep time uh, history in Australia. I wondered if you could maybe just capture your understanding of the changes that have been made and this new content that we're talking about. The first thing I want to say is that I think it's going to be quite challenging for teachers and more challenging for Year 7 students. These are really difficult concepts for people to get their heads around, especially 13, 12, 13 year olds. And the challenge is going to be for teachers to be able to translate those difficult concepts into meaningful and understanding um, content for year seven children. Um, So I think there's a lot of work that that teachers are going to have to do, a lot of 
background work that they, they're going to have to do in order to um, get up to speed on this. And I'm not saying teachers are not capable of doing it. Of course they are. Teachers are always capable of making these changes. Um, but I think it's going to require them to put in a, a fair bit of time and um, extra reading to get up to speed. Now, we've had some of that content in the topic of ancient Australia before. But this is much more specific, and that's why I wrote that article for uh, for teaching history, just to give teachers an overview of the sort of things that they'll have to do to get up to speed. Hmm. Yeah, I must admit when I when I first saw that um, that content in the new version, uh, my immediate reaction was like, you know, this is going to be a, a bit of work for myself for many teachers, I think, um, and. Yeah, it's it it seemed uh, it's it's really fascinating content, no doubt about it. Uh, but how how it's going to work with Year Seven, I think, is where the work is going to lie, isn't it? It was far worse when we saw the draft, and I was very concerned about that. So I contacted uh, two two archaeologists who have been uh, very interested in what goes on in schools, and that's uh, Michael Westaway and Martin Poor, and we got together and we put in a very comprehensive uh, set of feedback to to ACARA and I'm really pleased to say that they did pay attention to what we we um, recommended but it is still very very difficult stuff so yeah. so what what's the content like what sorts of themes and stuff are being uh, foregrounded let's just talk about that specifically for a minute I think the first thing that teachers and kids will have to get their heads around is the conceptual framework because we're so used to working within the construct of history. So history is about written sources and this is not about written sources at all. And that's why I talked about thinking archeologically because it's a different way of thinking about the past. So we train kids to think about or to analyze written sources and, and artifacts and all these other things. but when we come to deep time we it, it's a whole lot of other other evidence that we're dealing with so we've got archaeology in itself and then we've got scientific evidence and most importantly we've got oral histories and cultural knowledge from first nations peoples uh, so it's very different from being able to analyze a picture or a painting or a a gobbet of text and that's that's a major conceptual or I guess procedural um, adjustment that teachers are going to have to make teaching this unit. Mm, absolutely yeah and I think even putting stories together from those sorts of sources is something that not all uh, history teachers you know um, have have necessarily trained in haven't it you know it's like a lot of us have degrees where we've we've learned to read text and we've learned to put arguments together based on text so putting putting arguments together based on objects and oral histories and and different sorts of sources is actually a real challenge for teachers first and then obviously <laughs> they've got to teach that to students right so well it's a whole lot more work for teachers <laughs> yeah. but that's I, that's not unusual no no I think we'll be busy and I, you know I think my, my reaction was that that I looked at the the update and I thought most of it was fairly you know there were things I didn't agree with necessarily but most of it was fairly comfortable except for this bit where I thought okay this is going to be the challenge this is where teachers will want the you know the extra time and effort and so on so let's um let's head into to the article that you wrote because this is a great article and I'd, I'd I wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone who's trying to sort of start to think about these issues of deep time. So this was written for the term one edition of uh, the History Teachers Association, New South Wales Journal Teaching History. Title is Thinking Archaeologically About Australia's Deep Time History. And what I want to do is not sort of go through every aspect of the article, but just pick on some introductory issues so that if people are starting to think this through, they can begin to kind of grapple with some of the key concepts. So let's start with deep time itself. What's that What's that expression? What is that idea referring to? Well, the expression comes from geology. It's been adapted uh, over time uh, in, in modern times. And what it really refers to is that enormous expanse of time from the emergence of humans about 200,000 years ago, and, and that in itself is debatable, up until the appearance of writing, which is about 500, five and a half thousand years ago. 
So that's an enormous amount of time for anyone to get their heads around, especially young people. Yeah, and, and young people who, you know, um, uh, are 12, 13 years old, you know, a year seems like a long time, right? So 60,000 years is just a completely different measure of everything, the universe time. Yeah, so it's massive. Um, and there's another thing I just wanted to point out in terms of these concepts of time, uh, especially for teachers to understand that these uh, dates and everything are debatable. So you're not, they have to get used to the fact that, you know, as we were talking about earlier, that when you're dealing with modern history or history or, of, um, well, history that is written, you have, you have dates that are uh, often, well, they, they're dated by years and or reigns of people or whatever. These dates are flexible. They're, they're debatable. So when we say, we use the term circa, which is about, which we do in ancient history as well, but there's even less um, certainty about these dates. So it, it, teachers need to understand that when they see these dates, um, they will see variations on those and not to worry about that. And there's a there's even a change in some of the language too, or not a change, but a sort of a different emphasis, isn't there? I mean, I, I if I've got it right, there seems to be a lot more, um, even just the, the expression before the present is way more common when you're talking about deep time rather than these traditional divisions of history into, you know, AD and BC or whatever, you know, whatever other version that's common. Well, that's something I've been banging on about since the Australian curriculum was introduced because they got it wrong in the first iteration. And they had in in the first iteration of the, uh, of the Australian curriculum, they had 60,000 BC, which is wrong. When you're dealing with deep time, you you're not using a Christian dating system for obvious reasons. You're it, it's based on scientific evidence. So the term is before present, and that goes back to a well, it is a date that was set uh, at uh, 1950, around 1950 when radiocarbon dating was um, invented, and so that's the time frame that you use for dating so even the dating system and the nomenclature and everything is different so teachers have to be very aware of that and it's it's actually a much easier way to describe time when you're dealing with young kids because you just say years ago so technically it's bp or before present but you can just say um 200 000 years ago um kids as you would know jonathan they they find it really difficult even up to you know the senior students um, doing ancient history dealing with um, BCE and CE and all that um, thinking about time backwards you know dating backwards um, it's a little bit easier in that respect but it's just it just means a shift in the way we talk about time yeah absolutely and it, and it shifts a marker doesn't it to, to not necessarily being one way of seeing time you know if we're just talking about years ago it sort of opens it up to a I like that expression, you know, it's a simpler way of thinking about time in one sense and which sort of leads into a more complex view of time as well, though. So that's really interesting. Um, you mentioned before as well, and it's, a, and it's a theme in the article that, you know, deep time history is the expression used in the, in the curriculum, but history may actually be a little bit unhelpful in this context. So do you want to sort of explore that a bit more? Well, I'm going to be a bit pedantic here because technically it is not history. Because uh, if we think of history, I mean, look, some people will debate this with me, and I certainly have had debates with Martin Poor about this, um, that his, history, I'm a purist, history is about when written, <laughs> written sources emerge. And uh, we're dealing with the time before that. So I, I think it's, it was wrong to use that term in the curriculum. I would prefer to use the term deep time past. So it's all about the sources, I think, uh, sources of evidence. Yeah. And you also you also mentioned the the expression thinking archaeologically, which I, I've I sort of really liked in that piece. Um, and and you brought it up just a little bit earlier before. Do you want to contrast that for us with something that probably most history teachers, I think, who've trained in the last fifteen to twenty years, would be, you know, fa fairly familiar with, which is this expression of you know thinking historically or historical thinking. What's the contrast between thinking archaeologically? and thinking historically? I think the term historical thinking, when that, that emerged about 20 years ago, that was one of the great breakthroughs in conceptualising um, history and history teaching. But because I've trained as an archaeologist, I think 
I think differently. And so I always found that a little bit limiting to the way that I approach studying the past. So I started to talk about archaeological thinking and thinking archaeologically as something a little bit distinctive to historical thinking. Now, I think if we if we compared the two ways of thinking, you'd see a lot of parallels. But I think what distinguishes archaeological thinking is that you have that uh, the spatial dimension. Archaeology is all about being rooted into a place and space at a particular time or over a period of time. And it, it requires an understanding of not just the dimension of space in that time or space and time, but it requires an understanding of all these other factors that go into understanding what happened in that place at that time. So you've got... Um, for example, um, you've got uh, the dimensions of um, length and breadth and height, and uh, then you've got to think about how people fitted into those places and what they were doing at that time and, and how they interacted with the environment. So it's much more uh, steeped in the environment, I would say, than, than just um, thinking about, you know, uh, um, texts and, and all those things. Does that make sense? It's, it's a... Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think I think it's what I what I sort of get the impression I get from you discussing this is that it's sort of an extension of some of these things. Like you said, there's lots of overlap between historical thinking and archaeological thinking. You know, archaeologists are interested in change. You know, they're interested in the significance of different events. So, so there's there's lots of architecture there. You might say that's that's overlapping, but but it's not the same skill as you say to sort of think about an archaeological site, perhaps than to, to, you know, reading a set of documents from early colonial history or something. That's a different sort of set of um, challenges, perhaps. Yes, and I think when we get down to the details of it, it's things like excavation. It's not always excavation, but it's that that inquiry that is rooted in the earth, really, in, in the soil, where you, you get down to the details of what happened in that landscape, in that space at that time. One of the other things that I think is daunting about the, the if we go back to sort of the time aspect of this again, and we've, we're talking about, you know, huge sweeps of time, and if it's the case that, you know, we take that 60,000 years before the present of a, the arrival of people to Australia and so on, even that, you know, it's not quite 250,000 years of Homo sapiens, ex, you know, expansion into the, in, around the globe, but it's still 60,000 years, which is massive. One of the things that worries me as a teacher is that, I think students and and teachers as well uh, find it easier to hang um, teaching off stories, and you know thinking about what's the story in the sixty thousand years. One of the things that I've been sort of reading about and, and sort of thinking about along these lines is this sort of transition from um, Pleistocene to Holocene seems to be a fairly important backbone to the story we could tell about this. Can you flesh that out a bit for us? I think you're, you're onto something there with stories. And one of the other things I wanted to mention, going back to your question about archaeological thinking, I think archaeologists have to have very, very good imaginations, but imaginations, it's, it's what I call um, imagination that, that is based on evidence, right? So it's not just pulling things out of the, out of the air and, and just making up things, but it has to be uh, being able to reconstruct past landscapes and, and environments and, and people. Now, one of the problems we have here is that we don't have people who are individuals on which to construct our stories where we, where we do when we have written sources. Um, so we have actual people who are writing later on who, who we can hear their voices, we, can, we know who they are. Whereas when you're talking about deep time past, it's all very generic. We're talking about people in general. So we have to try to imagine, uh, it's really hard to imagine what individuals were like at that time. So we have to imagine them collectively as people. So this is where the stories come come into play and, and archaeological imagination will come into play there. And, and teachers are very good at this kind of thing about 
uh, making up stories or based on evidence, um, telling stories to, to students. And, and this is perfect pedagogy for year sevens, for the, the 12 and 13 year olds we're talking about, trying to imagine what life was like when Mungo Man and Mungo Lady lived 42,000 years ago. Uh, what was that environment like in the uh, Wallandra Lake area? Um, all of that sort of thing is what teachers need to start to think about when they're trying to convey the stories about this um, deep time to their students. And so um, just to capture that, um, that Pleistocene Holocene thing, um, what, what, what's the major transition that's happening there? You know, I mean, like I kind of, I kind of think of what am I going to do in week one with year seven with this topic? And this is one of the things that I think about is going in there and saying, look, you know, setting up the whole scene and setting up the sort of the, the aim of, of the topic and so on. But, but to capture their attention and give them something concrete, you know, one of the things that I'd be thinking about is saying, right, so, so uh, we are 60,000 years and generally it's divided into these two sort of broad periods. And these are the big things we see happening so that you've got some orientation is that is that a use? Is it useful? I suppose is the question. And and secondly, um, you know, what what is the change if 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 that's the story? Well, the change is the melting of the ice, so it's climate change, right? That's that's what made the big difference. And it didn't happen overnight. Obviously, it happened over thousands of years that these landscapes were changing. Um, and I think using Pleistocene and Holocene. And just being able to keep it really simple for year seven kids and being able to paint a picture and tell a story of what life was like for humans during the Pleistocene period is where you start. Now, one of the great um, archaeological sites that you can use for that is Kutikaina Cave in Tasmania, which was a Pleistocene cave. And uh, there, the evidence is that um, Aboriginal people were living in this cave uh, during the Ice Age. And that when you start talking about things like that, it makes you understand the incredible, incredible resilience and adaptability that humans had at that time to be able to live and survive uh, during this really harsh climate. And what they were doing at, in Kutakina Cave, the archaeologists found evidence of this, is that they were... Uh, killing wombats and um, wallabies and they were harvesting the marrow and eating the marrow because that was the best thing for them in terms of survival in the half, harsh climate. Now that's a great story you can start with for kids and they do understand Ice Age because they, I'm sure as little kids they were watching um, <laughs> the movies about the Ice Age but um, that's another little bit of deconstructing that teachers will have to do. Um, but it also gives an insight into, as I said, the, well, the ingenuity of Aboriginal people and their adaptability and their ability to survive in harsh climates. Um, so that's a message there that, that teachers can get across about, about um, Aboriginal people in Australia. And that's really uh, important. I think that's that's one of the other challenges, actually, that I've been sort of starting to think through a little bit as well is, you know, if I teach Russian history or something, I can kind of, you know, give you 20 names of historians you'd want to read, you know, but if someone says, okay, what are the 20 best sites to understand, you know, Australia's deep time history, I'd probably get, to, you know, maybe a dozen, not nowhere near, you know, what I could cite in terms of historiography. So even being able to sort of go, this site's really great for telling these stories and these sites are really great for telling these stories and, and bringing these, this sort of evidence into the, the picture, that's going to be another interesting side to the process of preparation I think. I, I think that'd be another good article for teaching history. Yeah yeah the 20, 20 top sites for understanding this yeah. I wouldn't even go with 20 I, I'd go with about five maybe 10 at the most that's an, enough for year sevens to get their heads around and just have them spread between Pleistocene and Holocene. It's not it's not easy to find some of these sites as well um, and they, as I said they're quite contested in terms of um, interpretation and the other thing is um, with another concept the teachers are going to have to get their heads around it's not just the uh, the time and the description of time but it's also the landscape I keep saying in my article the 
the place or the the continent that we now call Australia that's because Australia didn't really exist as we know it in those times um, because there were mega continents so the mega continent that Australia was part of was called Sahul so we need to get used to using that term of Sahul and even the term Sahul is a construct. It was, it's, a, it's a description that was um, a name given by scientists later on. So there were two major cont uh, continents, uh, Sahul and Sunda. So Sahul is made up of uh, New Guinea, Australia and Tasmania. So Tasmania was connected to the mainland at that time. So it's, uh, yeah, those, that's another spatial concept that teachers are going to have to get their heads around and start using those terms with kids. Uh, so you were talking, you asked me about when, what, what was the change between Pleistocene and Holocene. Uh, it was the climate change, the water, the ice melted uh, at the around um, estimated 11,700. You'll find that those dates are contested as well. Um, the ice started to melt, the seas rose and Tasmania was separated from mainland Australia. So it's even that concept, isn't it? It's like, um, you know, Australia, as we think of it, like th there's a misleading part of the title of this Australia's deep time history, because we, you know, by, by saying Australia, we've already sort of, um, I guess, put, pe put an idea in people's heads about what we're talking about. But Australia as a thing was really quite different. And that's the first maybe imaginative leap we have to take in this whole process. Yeah, it's that spatial thing that I was talking about with archaeological thinking. You've got to think about places being different. And the other really cool thing that um, teachers can focus in on and that kids, year seven kids are going to love, is megafauna, right? Some of those images of the, um, I love that term, megafauna anyway, um, those giant marsupials that roamed around Australia. And th there's, there's some really cool sites that that um that you can look at in terms of megafauna and um just understanding that you know kids kids love dinosaurs little, little kids three-year-olds are always really interested in dinosaurs so you can um teachers can channel the you know the year seven's three three-year-old and uh, three-year-old self and talk about megafauna i think that's really exciting that's another great story to tell and so maybe that's another strategy for the, you know, just to sort of focus on that idea of, you know, maybe teachers trying to get familiar with half a dozen important sites is, is you know, you said spread them across Pleistocene and Holocene, but another thing might be to sort of try to find sites that really do a unique job, like a site that's really kind of going to tell us a lot about megafauna is one. We want to pick another site that tells us a lot about some other theme. So you know, there's, there's, we're sort of spreading not only across time, but across different aspects of life and, and um, culture as well, I suppose. Yeah. So the site, a really good site for the megafauna um, story is Cuddy Springs. And that's because it's, as far as I know, it's the only site to date where you've got the interaction between humans and megafauna, right? Evidence of humans and megafauna. And there's a big debate there about whether humans cause the extinction of megafauna. Now, that's a lovely debate that the kids could explore. Um, it is very complex, but if teachers can get it down to the very simple thing about, um, you know, the question is, did, did humans cause the extinction of me megafauna? Then um, they've got that's a really nice lesson to put together, or a couple of a sequence of lessons if they're interested in doing that one. So the the site for that is Cuddy Springs in New South Wales. That's um yeah that's that's a really interesting and I think when you were talking about that um one of the things that's, that sort of sticks out to me as well is that you know yes we're talking about a, a world that's often very very different to our own but also there's common ground here, isn't there? I mean, you know, modern humans and, you know, um, the expansion of urban spaces and the causing of the extinction. So, so you can link it to something concrete in our own times and then try to sort of say, well, there's a, there's a, a very different story here, but there's a parallel with things that we see in our own time and day. That's the cross-curriculum priority of sustainability that you can definitely weave in there and tick the box on that one. Yeah. Um, and uh, sustainability is is a theme that you can look at all the way through 
uh, with d the deep time past. How did humans sustain their lives over those long periods of time? And another p thing I point out in my article is that Indigenous peoples were not static over time. I mean, you've got to think about it. This is an enormous amount of time. People are not going to stay the same. They are going to adapt to the environment and uh, and that's what Indigenous Australians did, First Nations Australians did. They adapted over time. We don't have accounts of that uh, in every, every single type of adaption and, and all of that, but we do know that they certainly evolved um, physically and they uh, adapted to, to environments over that time. Actually, that's, the, that's where I wanted to go next. And I wanted to qu quickly read a, a quote that you put in this piece by Anne McGrath and Lynette Russell, uh, just because I think it captures this really, really nicely. Uh, and you write, or, or they write, uh, traditional Western historians have focused on change, key moments and events. As a result, Indigenous peoples prior to European arrival have been seen incorrectly as unchanging people confined to a timeless zone, a kind of limbo before history itself began. Indigenous people were not unchanging, but rather they were inventive and dynamic. I mean, that captures brilliantly what you're, you're getting at there. Can you maybe just go into a little bit of, give us a taste of what this inventiveness and dynamism is? Well, this is another conceptual change that teachers are going to have to get their heads around. And I do write about this in the article, that we've or if we, we've grown up, we've all grown up in this tradition. If we, if we, uh, non-indigenous people, we've grown up in this in tradition of understanding history as change over time, and it's uh, our curriculum is based on this whole idea of civilizations and progress. And I don't know if you've noticed, it's a very subtle change, but we we did recommend this. Uh, that they take out the term civilizations. Archaeologists haven't used that for a long time because civilization means the process of civilizing, and that's a loaded term. So the term now is that, that well, archaeologists and anthropologists have used for a very long time is cultures, so cultural change. Um, if you look at uh, Indigenous cultures and First Nations people, they'll tell you they don't really care about uh, change and progress and things like that. They they don't really um, have they don't really value or put value onto that concept. Um, so that they just did what they had to do when they needed to do it. So getting back to your your question and and that comment, um, Jonathan. Um, I think it goes back to that that idea of adaptation. They adapted when they needed to. So if they needed to invent something that uh, caught uh, uh, eels, for example, at Bujbim, then that's what they did, right? Because they needed to. They, unlike what we do today, they 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 didn't invent things. Well, as far as we know, they didn't invent things just for the sake of inventing them and and um, to sell them in um, a marketplace or exactly yeah, the yeah. capitalist marketplace, which is what you know what we have with a lot of the the stuff that we have now. Uh, the manufacturing, it, it's about uh, quick turnover and and a redundancy, you know, things that break down. They didn't do that. So if they didn't need to adapt their, their uh, stone toolkits to things, then they didn't. They just kept using them. But when they did, that's how they changed. So there are examples of change over time um, in the archaeological record, but there's a lot of evidence of continuity. So we have to be really careful with the language that we use when we're teaching this topic, that we don't use loaded Eurocentric terms which devalue Indigenous peoples. Yeah, because I think you're right. There is, a, I mean, even, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the sort of narrative in the curriculum, so to speak, is, you know, the ancient to the modern and there's a sort of, it's an easy way to get the wrong impression from that, isn't there? If you're not... If you're not sort of prepared enough as a teacher to sort of say, well, you know, does this actually mean progress and those, you know, raise those sorts of questions, you can easily end up telling a story that gives this impression of things getting better over time. But yeah, I, I like that notion of, of it. maybe it's a more micro kind of adaptation and micro story that you're telling, like, or a set of micro stories rather than this big overarching, you know, um, from ancient civilizations, as you say, to the modern world. You're talking about people adapting in really micro ways time and time again, 
and over 60,000 years, that means a lot, right? Like it means a lot of change, but also a lot of continuity as well. Yeah, and it just shows um, how, how smart humans are. That's a great story to tell. Um, they can, I don't know if you ever watched that, that show called Survivor um, or Alone or whatever on SBS where people have to go into harsh landscapes and survive for long periods of time. Well, if, if, if the kids are watching that or if teachers are watching that, that's what people had to do thousands of years ago, thousands and thousands of years ago. They had to learn to survive in those landscapes and that's where ingenuity comes into play the smartness of humans i mean when you think about how human brains have in, had evolved by that time to be able to adapt and survive i think those are two really good themes that you can use adaptation and survival how did these humans manage to to do this in these harsh conditions and another factor is how did they get to travel to sahul how, how did humans get from, well, we're talking about Africa and the out of Africa theory, which, which teachers are supposed to start with, and that in itself is quite fraught, I think, and, and debatable dates and everything. Um, how did humans get from Africa down to this harsh environment um, that was um, Sahul? Well, there was a lot of ingenuity there, there. And how did they even know where they were going when they were walking? Or if they were, you know, if they invented watercraft to be able to get there, that's an incredible story to be able to tell about human ingenuity. I think is part of the challenge here too, extending that point about stories and picking up on some of these other themes about, you know, the 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 huge scale that we're talking about here. That's part of the challenge, isn't it? Learning perhaps to tell stories on a scale that that we're not used to. Many many history teachers are not used to anyway. Like. You know, this idea of the out of Africa theory, I always find that, you know, you've got like a period or a half a period to talk about that with year seven. How do you condense that into this story that's fairly coherent but reliable? This is part of what we, we've got to get better at too, don't we? This is a really big challenge for teachers to take these incredibly difficult scientific concepts and make them meaningful to 12 and 13 year olds. This topic would be much better positioned with seniors. Uh, and, and this is a big ask on teachers to be able to do that. And I think, you know, what we've talked about here is the storytelling, but keeping things simple, right? Um, kids, can, that's a, there's so much for kids to have to remember here. Uh, and even for teachers to remember, just keep it simple. Tell the stories, uh, pick up a couple of, of key concepts to hang the ideas on and the other thing is that you we we talked earlier about the lack of individuals i guess with names but we do have a couple of examples of uh individual human remains that that add a bit of color to the story so if you can if teachers can focus in on uh the uh, on mungo man and mungo lady they're good stories to tell because you can build um, stories around that. You know, you can flesh that out with uh, what happened to those people. What, um, and it's not just the burials that you've got to talk about. This is where the archaeological thinking comes in. Burials are, um, yes, they're, they're the humans who were, who were placed there and they obviously had a life. But this, another story is who buried them and how did they bury them and why did they bury them? like that and what did they put in there with them why was uh one cremated and one one inhumed what one was buried those sorts of stories that's where the archaeological thinking and archaeological imagination comes in it's the ability to imagine what is no longer there and i talk about that in my article so um yeah building in those stories of some of those people another one is narrabeen man uh, which is relatively, <laughs> uh, in the broad scheme of time we're talking about here, that's 4,000 years ago. Um, that's a great story to tell about that uh, that that's, that um, body that was found at 
the Narrabeen Narra Bean bus stop accidentally. I think and... the discovery story is interesting in and of itself, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a shock. I mean, the, the guys doing the electricals were, you know, they come across this body. Um, and I did a, um, a sequence of learning for that when, uh, years ago when we uh, first started developing learning materials for the new curriculum. So um, I set it up as a history mystery and, you know, whatever happened to an Arabian man so that kids can do that as an investigation and they can um, try to figure out how he died, what happened to him, what were the circumstances around his death. So those are a couple of things that teachers can do. But, again, my message is keep it simple. Yeah, and I think I think there'll be a, a, a sort of a... Um... Uh, a bit of a responsibility if you want to put that way on on our part as teachers to kind of not I mean obviously we want to do the right thing and we, we want to be prepared and we want to be as accurate as we can but we also have to accept that this is this topic for year seven we're not going to be able to to you know explore this at the level that you might with a third year group of archaeology students at Sydney University or something like that right so we have to be a bit light on ourselves and I guess be a bit forgiving that we're not going to get every detail here and there and be able to pack in everything we'd like we're going to have to be selective yes and it'll it'll be the first run through and uh teachers will be able to see how well things work and how some other things don't work and then yes don't expect to be perfect Uh, Keep it simple, keep it short, just pick out the good stuff and focus on on those stories and then, you know, move on, I think. Mm. So we're all going to be, I guess, scrambling for things, uh, resources. So your article is a great place to start. And in fact, that whole edition of the journal was really you know, purposely designed, I suppose, to start the conversation um, around these issues. But do you have some like go-to books and resources that you think for a teacher, these are, you know, these are going to be readable, but they're also going to give you a fair bit to work with? I mentioned two in in the article, and the, the first one is Billy Griffith's book on deep time dreaming. It's just readable. It's just beautiful. That's very true. We interviewed him a few years ago. And- <laughs> I, I mean, it was like reading a novel or something, that book. It was brilliant, yeah. He's he's a great storyteller. So that should inspire teachers to be able to tell stories. I mean, he's got great stories about archaeologists and, and how they discovered things and, um, um, and, and he's got some interesting uh, stories about the sites and what they found and all of that. So that's a great plas- place to start for teachers. So that, that would be school holiday reading, really, or evenings when you're just trying to when you you finish your busy day and getting into bed and the other one I recommended was um, Althea Kinsella's book Ancient Australia Unearthed um, Thea Kinsella um, I spoke to her recently and she's doing an up she's thinking about doing an update for this because this was written for the first iteration of the Australian curriculum and it was written for year seven students and it's beautifully illustrated it is visually stronger and uh, it's light on text so year sevens can read it Um, lots of images she's got examples of sites for those periods that we talked about for the Pleistocene and Holocene uh, lots of maps and things like that so those two are definitely on my list my top two on the on the list of things to to for teachers to read Brilliant. I would, uh, I've got like four or five other questions swimming around in my head, but I, I think we need to cut it off at some point. So I really appreciate you chatting to us uh, and extending the discussion that you put in the article and I appreciate you writing the article too. I do think it's going to be a really valuable um, point of departure for a lot of people to start thinking this through. So thank you again. And um, maybe, maybe we'll see some future additions to it um, down the track. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. I really enjoyed the conversation.